self-determination. It's the ability to choose. And I think that that's what we all should have a right to, and that's what we're all fighting for. Public debate is vital in a democratic society because if the public doesn't take part, then the politicians take over and decide everything for themselves. And a place like the Bali is important because that's where the public gets to say what they think and shape their opinions and listen to debate. It's incredibly important that people continue to speak out in this way. Acknowledge the limitations and taking responsibility for questioning the limitations. With knowledge comes a certain beauty. We are then in a position to take action on that. Particularly in this very noisy, fast culture, what documentary does, I think, is to take time to make meaning. Documentaire films and kunst in het algemeen is soms een plek waar de mening en waar de positie belangeloos is. Je mag er gewoon zijn, je mag leren. En de Bali is zo'n plek. Welkom, en dat is dan meteen het laatste Nederlandse woord dat vanavond hier zal klinken. Welcome. My name is Vonne van der Meer, chair of PEN Nederland, PEN Netherlands. I want to welcome especially our guest speakers of tonight. Chileri Lhang, Burhan Sönmez, writers, a Turkish, Turkish Dutch translator, Hanneke van der Heide, and Petra Stienen, writer and, now I have to say it right, human rights diplomat, <laughs> who will moderate this evening. PEN, and this evening is an initiative of PEN Nederland. PEN's core business is a uh, to react on what is happening in the world with writers who are in danger, who are arrested, who are in prison. We are always asked to, to react directly and better today than tomorrow. But Penn felt a strong need to not only to react all the time, but also take our time to reflect. And that's what this evening is hopefully about, to reflect on the topic of what it is a writer, what it is to be a writer, a Turkish writer in exile, but also the situation of translators in Turkey. And also, yeah, what happens to your language when you are living in exile. I'll leave it now to Petra Stienen to moderate, to interview the writers. Please, Petra, come here. Thank to you the so stage. Much. Okay. Merhaba. Is the f yeah. Merhaba. This is about the only Turkish word I know. I, of course, teşekkür ederim and çok güzel. Um, for those of you who know me as an Arabist at a Middle Eastern human rights diplomat, I was a little bit surprised when I was asked to moderate this <coughs> evening, but I can now see why. Because the themes of today are themes that are very close to my heart and I guess to the heart of the audience as well. Let's do uh, a little bit of getting to know each other. Um, who is a writer? in the audience. We have one writer, Munir Samuel, thank you. My brother is here. Who, uh, yeah, Frauke, sorry, yeah, the light is, um, I'm, vain. I'm very vain, so I'm not wearing my glasses. So uh, if I don't recognize you immediately, don't take this personally. Uh, and I say Willemijn Lamp, you have also done a lot on literary festivals, uh, on literature. You had a festival on Turkey's literature. Yeah, this is your uh, commercial break. When will it be? It's from the 11th From the 11th of the 13th of October in Tolhuis Tuin, no? Exactly. exactly. Um, who, because I'm a little bit intimidated, so I really want you to show hands. Um, who are the Turkish, the Turkey experts in the room? Sort of the, 
non-Turkish Dutch Turkey experts. Of course, I see. <laughs> Joost, hello, welcome. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> oh, new kid, new kid on the block. Who are you? I don't know you. Hello, my name is Tan. You're a Turkish expert. <laughs> Apparently so, yeah. Um, and I also see a lot of people who I think have, uh, in one way or the other, a close connection to Turkey. Now, I have to tell you, when we were preparing this, and this is the moment if you think, ah, it's good to tell me, Petra, because then I can still catch the movie, we're not going to do an analysis of the latest elections and the election results. We're also not going to look into why the lira is dropping. Um, nobody's leaving yet, huh? But we will look into the politics of writing, the writings of politics. We will look into the question, what does it mean when you have to leave? And does the language leave with you? What does it mean when after you left, you come back? Has the language changed? Has the place changed? Uh, we will discuss two books. Uh, the book Istanbul, Istanbul by Burhan Dunmas that will be published today in Dutch. I had the fortunate, I was fortunate to already be able to read the proofs and it's amazing. We'll talk about it later. And we will also discuss the book Verbannen, Exile by Chiller Ilhan. And we will discuss the books by Oran Pamuk and other Turkish writers <laughs> with Hanneke van der Heide. But without further ado, I would like a very warm hand for our first writer of tonight, Burhan Dunmas. Uh, Sunmas, sorry, uh, Sunmas. Good evening, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank you for coming, and I'd like to thank you to Penn Netherlands for organizing this great evening event. The word exile has got so many meanings for a writer. It's a country, Turkey, for me, that you feel that you are in exile at the moment, because it's not the same country that I was born in. It's a different place. At home, I feel that I'm not at home. And for an exile, you always want to go back to your hometown, where you were born, where you grew up. When it comes to Turkey, the current situation, the current atmosphere of today, people like me, we want to change the situation, uh, the conditions of the country, not to go back to the old bad days, but to pick up some good points, some good sides of the old days, and to polish them and to renew them and to end your feeling of being in exile. Bertolt Brecht went to exile during the Second World War. He wrote a poem, uh, roughly he was saying, don't put a nail on the wall, just put your jacket on the chair. That means because we are not going to stay here long. We will go back home again very soon. We don't know how soon is that soon. Sometimes it takes one year, sometimes it takes 10 years or a life. I returned back home from a long exile after 10 years. I returned back to Turkey a few years ago as a writer, as a novelist. It was the country that I had left years ago and also if it was not the country that I had left. It's a totally different place. Now my dream, or the dream of people like me, is to create a country or to reach a land, a country that everybody will be happy. I don't know how it's possible, but that's a dream, like in the story of Homer's, they talk about Ithaca a dreamy and imaginative place maybe, but it's the end of exile. Exile means it starts with 
in English, X. And also, I'd like to add a small point, maybe out of context. In Turkey, for a writer like me, we say Turkish writers in exile. I was born in a Kurdish family. I learned Turkish at primary school, but my language was forbidden. I couldn't use my mother tongue, Kurdish, at school. Then I became a lawyer. I couldn't use it at court. So I didn't gather that knowledge of my mother tongue as a writer. Now I write in another language, in Turkish, which is a beautiful, wonderful language. In this life, we experience so many different types and layers of being exiled. In the end, exile is the feeling of a middle-aged man who is always think that life is long enough will bring him back or her back to his or her childhood. We are all after it. Thank you. Thank you. Having lived in the Middle East, having been to Turkey quite often, there's something we all do when we learn about a new person. And that happened to me last night when my friend Monique van der Weide sent me a text message. I'm so sorry, I can't be with you tomorrow because Chiller, she is Chiller's family. Her husband is like the brother of my husband. Now Monique is like my sister. I know Munir, um, you're my brother, but there are sisters in the extended family as well. And I think this is something that happens all the time when people are traveling, when they're in exile. I don't know, sometimes I feel we create a new home with the family we choose wherever we are when we cannot be in the country where we want to be. And so I'm very happy that I met a new family member tonight, <laughs> uh, a writer, which is also a family. Chiller Elhan, please take the floor and please a warm applause for my new family member. Goeie avond. We see in volgende jaar in Nederlands. Maar nu moet ik echt Engels spreken. So sorry for that. And I'm not as talented as Burhan, so I actually wrote a speech. I will read, but act as if I'm not reading and talking. Um, <clears throat> so, at the Dutch language course that I did last year, which wasn't enough, of course, I met a writer from Palestine. He had escaped from Palestine to Syria in 2010, and after the war started to Lebanon, from there with a boat to Libya, from there to Italy, and then to the Netherlands. His asylum application was accepted. After some time, he could bring his family here too. He considered himself a very lucky man. Our biggest concern during moving was how to scan our cat through security without losing her. At the airport, we didn't, obviously. With the sedative we gave her, she did not even attempt to jump from our arms. We came to the whole bunch that we are, four mammals. The only thing I had to apply for was a residence permit, which I got very easily. My husband and daughter already have Dutch passports. I consider myself a very lucky woman. But I did not see it coming. The emotional storm that was brewing behind the clouds. How some of the things that I considered to be me was left behind. How marrying a hybrid and being a part of a super international family for the last 20 years actually had little effect on my Turkish identity. We did not have to move to the Netherlands. It was a choice. It was a choice that was sort of imposed on us, injected bit by bit, let's say. That great big city, Istanbul, which Burhan explains beautifully in his novel, so please really read it, it's wonderful, that big city started to get narrower and narrower, like an animal that curls up into itself to protect itself. The city downsized itself. I made my life smaller and smaller. 
until a point came where I couldn't breathe anymore in that tiny, claustrophobic space that was left for me to live. I felt I didn't belong there anymore. It just didn't feel home. But then, what, what is home? I was born in Denizli, an uh, Anatolian spirited Asian town, city, sorry. Lived there until I was 11, then to Izmir, and a boarding school, then to Istanbul for the university, and stayed in Istanbul majorly. But it was Istanbul that made me, me. It made, me pos it, made it possible to free myself from my own internal exile as a child, as a teenager, as a woman, as a person. But then Istanbul, in years, was forced to become the mother who doesn't want to take ownership of her baby anymore. Then what is home? It's that idiom, that expression, that comes to your mind at that very right moment, and that idiom which cannot be translated exactly to any other language. It's that simple dish that you can find in any restaurant in your country, that dish that is impossible to, impossible to find, and if found, to contain the same taste when found. It's that temperature in which you know perfectly what to wear, not to get hot, not to get sick. It's the aging sun that doesn't burn, and Dutch sun is very strong, by the way. It's the smell of the Bosphorus that, Bosphorus that brings you your youth. It's those people that you sometimes get so much annoyed at, at the ignorance, at the nosy casual interference with your life that leaves you very little personal space, but it's your people. The Palestinian writer and I, no doubt his story is much tougher, much sadder. We still have something in common. We need to reroute, respeak, re-be. Extreme experiences, if used properly, pain or joy, are fruitful materials for literature, for a writer. This is my best consolation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please. Have a seat. Could I invite both of you to uh, come and sit with me here? You want to sit in the middle? Yeah. Um, I'm going to read a quote from Chiller. Um, you spoke at a conference recently in Lahore. The art and human and art and the human condition, and you said, and I'll quote, one neighbor trying to understand that neighbor. This is what literature does: the human gap, the insights. When you get an insight to that person, then you do not want to kill that person anymore. Maybe. Literature as a way to get the neighbor, not to kill the neighbor. Maybe. I'm looking at you, Burhan. Is that what literature does for you? Is that what your writing does for you? That's our hope. Uh, even though when we look at the history, uh, it hasn't worked always in that way. Sometimes people who shared the same songs killed each other. But still, we are trying to remind people that those songs or those literature or those stories has got another side. Uh, a better side, a more humanitarian side. You should not kill. You should help. You should think other people before yourself. That's, that's very important. How can we convey this idea? I think storytelling and literature is the best way. In your book, Exile, for Bonin, and I didn't read their CVs, but both of them, uh, both of the authors of today, got quite some prestigious prizes, and you got a European Union Literature Prize in 2011 for the book Exile. Um, it's a treacherous book. It's, uh, it's initially, I thought, there was innocence in not being at home. But then, there was no innocence at all. Almost every single page, you kill innocence. Why do you do that? Well, the dogs were innocent. My dog <laughs> characters. Um, well, I, I, I try to understand human condition, which is a huge task for a small woman like me, apparently. 
But um, I think crime and innocence are not black and white, for sure. And this is what I really try to do. Uh, so if we're, we, we're even as individuals, we give decisions, but our decisions are based on many factors that make us us. DNA, genetics, education, experiences, everything. So, um, so it, things are not uh, as uh, simple as they seem. This is sort of uh, my um, approach towards life. And I think it reflects uh, majorly on exile. What I found when I read your book is that you take on the invasion in Iraq you take on dogs that have female um, human female characteristics. There is the recurring question, why are there so many suicides in Batman? How do we connect all of, how do you want to connect all these stories? Is exile the connection or is there something deeper there? Well, I take, I take the word um, exile not, not only politically because I found out also in my experience, coming from a quite liberal uh, but quite patriarchal family where my mother had almost no word in the household, um, I gained my own fight with everything. And I actually found out that um, your home can be uh, your uh, jail or, or it can be your world, it can be a universe. Uh, and if you are not let to be you, then you actually are in exile. And in Turkey, unfortunately, we um, come across with many examples. If you're gay, if you're Turkish, if you're Alevi, if you're Armenian, if you're if you are not a Sunni Turkish m male, like you know, very quite similar to American white American man. So you actually you already are in exile in so many ways that you cannot really fulfill yourself. And if there, even if there are re reincarnations of life, or even if we live in parallel universes at, at the same time, at this moment, if you cannot realize yourself, then I think you already are in exile. So if there's a common theme, maybe uh, this might be the uh, point that uh, might uh, connect all the characters. The internal jail. In your book, Istanbul, Istanbul, 10 days. Of course, the Decamorona comes to mind. This is what your characters talk about as well. 10 days in a prison cell. But you take, as a writer, you take the characters out of their exile in jail into Istanbul. The upper world, the lower world. When I was reading the book, there was a lot of, there were a lot of riddles in the book. Burhan is the king of riddles, I can tell. Your son, who is now two years old, has something coming. Daddy loves riddles. Why do you put so, why did you put so many riddles in the story, in the stories of the, the, the prisoners? Um, I think uh, the matter of riddle comes from mother. Uh, my mother would uh, tell us fairy tales, Kurdish fairy tales, and also she would always add some riddles, ask a question and give an answer in one week times or in three days times. You, you would never get the answer in the same night. So the days would take and then in the village, in the small village, you would take that riddle or that question all around to everyone. So that all common society, everybody would share the same question and search for the same answer. Uh, that was a good feeling. I think subconsciously uh, I carry that tradition. So I use it in, in the book. But using that in, in that book uh, is not just uh, because of that uh, my personal tradition. Uh, in prison, especially in prison cells, uh, there is no time because it's always dark. There is not morning, evening. You don't have a uh, swatch on your wrist. Uh, the only thing passing time is words. You, if there is someone with you, you need to speak. 
you need to tell stories to each other. Uh, I remember uh, there was a journalist in the cell I was in uh, as a student. Uh, he started, he said, okay, I will tell you the story of Spartacus. And then it started. Every day we would tell stories and after certain days uh, you come to the end of the story, then you recap. You retell the stories that you told 10 days ago. And of course you have to put riddles. And some riddles, of course, consisting some interesting people like uh, the guard. You don't know guard, you have seen him for the first time in that cell block, but you pretend that you know him for long years and you ask questions about him, about his family. So you have to be funny and creative if you are in pain. Uh, that's big joy. He says with a smile on his face. <laughs> now one of the uh, prominent prisoners in Syria, a country where I lived for five years, is called Riyadh Turk. And he has been in solitary confinement for about 17 years. Some people call him the Syrian Nelson Mandela. And when he was interviewed about his prison time, he said, there are three things you need to do. You need to forget about time. You need to exercise every day. And don't think of the outside world any longer. Your characters do exactly the opposite. They glorify, romanticize, fantasize. Istanbul is like their common lover almost. Why did you choose Istanbul as the common lover for all your characters in these prison cells? Yeah. Um, this novel is about uh, Istanbul itself, rather than about uh, those people who are uh, being tortured every day. Uh, I wanted to see Istanbul as an independent en entity, uh, as an independent beauty. How we treat that beauty, how we love it, and how we destroy it. How can we see the beauty through the eyes of people who are in pain? That was the main question I asked myself. People are in pain and they are trying to describe or they are imagining to get to that beautiful city again. Uh, leaving that dark cell, go above ground and strolling on that streets again. Giving that dialect, uh, dialectic um, dilemma of pain and beauty gave me a big opportunity to describe it in a different way. I, uh, I had uh, a bit of recollection of the book of Jose Samarajo, The City of the Blind. Of course, you have a completely different style of writing, but still, the blindness in the dark prison cell and the imagination of your characters was so vivid and so lively. Um, where, who, who, who is mostly like you of the four characters of the doctor, of the uncle, of the, is it all four of you or is it too simple to see autobiography in it? Uh, th this is a very simple question because I think writers would never give any answer. They will say, oh, sorry, I cannot say anything about this question. Yeah, I know, but um, I'm not going to get you away. So uh, you're going to give us a riddle. <laughs> we have to yes, read the I, book I and then find <laughs> out, huh? Yeah. Um, yeah, about those characters. In, in some chapters, you know, um, sometimes you feel that, okay, I'm like that person. Mm -hmm. But in other chapters, you feel that, okay, I'm now like that person. Uh, it always changes, evolving around. And in the end, you feel that uh, every one of them uh, carrying some little part from yourself. And they're all in love with Istanbul, the healing city. Yes. yes. In your book, it's almost the opposite. Um, there is the, the cruelty is inside, but also outside. I mean, every single, I think almost, I, I, 
It's not short stories, it's not poems, it's not essays, it's not a novel. You have a completely unique style, I have to say. I really enjoyed it. They're like small paintings. Oh, yeah. that's the first. Thank yeah. you. They're like small paintings. That's yeah. nice. <laughs> yeah. um, but there's a lot of sadness in almost all of the paintings. What made you so sad? Uh, well, my agent told me to write a love novel after that, which still is not happening. My third book is more optimistic, uh, but still a bit bitter. Um, I was going through a very, it's very personal writing, you know. Uh, you, you know Ken Loach, he, he, he does really tough uh, movies of the working class, and then there was, I don't remember the name, but there was this movie he made about life, and I was like, oh, Ken Loach is in love. So you just uh, create things, uh, you cannot create things out of your own mood. And uh, that period, I was questioning a lot of things, and I was trying to be myself. And I was like a magnet, like your boy's uh, T-shirt, it says magnet. Mm -hmm. I was the magnet of pain. So it, all, the only thing I could see on the newspapers or in the news was uh, that bitterness that I, was, <coughs> I somehow could associate on the very deeper level with myself. Uh, and when you, um, of course, then I, I uh, made the book a lot smaller, I have to say, because I um, had lots of material, and I said, okay, I don't want any reader to cut their wrists, you know, I still need to put some nice things there. So I did, actually. Haven't you noticed? It starts with a love story, and it ends with a love story, please. <laughs> and then there are dogs, and... No, I, I, did, uh, I did put some nice elements, nice, but it was the period uh, that um, I just um, was uh, sort of associating with, let me say. It was translated into Dutch. Yeah. Have you read it in Dutch yourself? Well, I first, I didn't dare because I was like, oh, what, if, what if it's... You know, if, if it's not the feeling that I want to give, and even with my really broken Dutch, as I proved just uh, five minutes ago, uh, you could still sense it. Uh, I did just a, a few stories. I really actually opened the Turkish one, and then because you tend to forget what you write, right? Mm -hmm. I, I really just, you get bored of what you write. You want to write another one. Um, I sort of compared them. And uh, I thought, oh, okay, so she really got it, <laughs> uh, my, my translator, so she really felt it. Uh, but of course, it, it doesn't feel the same, even here speaking English. I'm not actually the original person that I am. I'm a clone of myself, a good clone, maybe because I'm very comfortable with English. And even with Dutch, it's like the clone of the clone. So uh, I don't know, uh, but it, it was okay, I think. Because you, uh, Burhan, you spoke about how you only learned Turkish in primary school. Very small personal note. I'm raised in a province where we spoke Limburgs at home, and then, which is a dialect, and then we learned Dutch when I was six. I learned Dutch when I was six years old. Um, you obviously learned other languages. You learned Turkish. You learned English. You also have many layers. Is it a richness, or is it something that you regret that you cannot write now in Kurdish? I mean, are you writing in Kurdish? I'm assuming that you're not writing no. in Kurdish. No, you cannot. Um, the reason, because now I'm a novelist in Turkish. Mm -hmm. My Turkish is much better than my Kurdish. So the literature is the matter of language. Which language is good enough to express yourself and your imagination, then you dive in, into that language. Uh, speaking different languages is, uh, gives you richness. But when it comes to Kurdish, I have to say that it's different. The reason is that. It's not like now I speak English, and I lived in England 10 years, and I write in Turkish with the knowledge of English literature. Of course, it gives me kind of richness, but it's different. With the Kurdish one, you know that the Kurdish that I learned from my mo mother is forbidden. Mm. It is destined to be forgotten and to die. 
So subconsciously, you recreate your language in another language. In Turkey, that's my theory. It is easy when you read a novel to understand whether it was written or it's written by a Turkish or Kurdish writer. Because the way you... Can you give an example? Yeah. The way they form a sentence or the way they, um, they describe especially a scene or the flow of the language, you definitely sense it. You, uh, when you gave your introduction, you spoke about returning home and not feeling home. But you also not feel home in your language, because when you travel, when you are in exile or when you're living abroad, 10 years' time, the colloquialism change, the references to movies, to newspapers, to TV series, to other books. Did you feel that maybe your Turkish was impoverished when you came back in Turkey? Sure. Mm, maybe we have to emphasize the opposite side of the thing that we, are, we have been talking about. I mean, sticking with one language or with your mother tongue is not a good thing. As a human being, we have to travel like nomadic people into other cultures, other languages. We have to see them, we have to experience them, and we have to get benefit of them. Uh, unless any culture and other, any language is oppressed and forbidden. Everyone's culture should be free, then we have to stroll and wander in that big ocean. That's the freedom of culture. Beautiful. I think this is a very good way of uh, going to our next speaker. And please stay with us here, because we're talking about language, about how you can see from the grammar, the vocabulary somebody used, where the writer comes from, whether it's a Turkish or a Kurdish writer. And we are very happy to have Hanneke van der Heide with us. She is the Dutch translator of Orhan Pamuk and other Turkish writers. And she will give a brief introduction and then join us for the discussion. Please, a warm applause for her. I hope uh, you can all hear me. Um, my position here is uh, indeed a different one uh, from the, the position of uh, Chila Ilhan and Burhan Sönmez. In the first place, I'm not a writer, but uh, a translator, an author, but a translator, and translating author, and not, a, uh, not so much a writing author. And the second difference is that I'm Dutch. Uh, I've lived in Turkey. I've lived in Turkey as a translator for quite a while. But I'm a Dutch, a speaker of Dutch, and I write, uh, translate into uh, Dutch. Still, I'm, I must also say uh, that I'm very happy that uh, this evening we also talk about translation. Because I think very often when it comes to, uh, to literature, there's talked about the books and about the authors, but hardly ever about the translators. Translators really tend to be invisible. Um, translators are very much tied to their authors, the authors they translate. And um, you might not know exactly what the, the translation market is in, in Turkey, but there are really quite a lot of people working as a, a literary translator, I think really in thousands uh, are their numbers. Um, one of the differences I said is that I'm a translator and not so much a writer, which means um, as translators we are so much tied to uh, the authors we translate uh, that also the, the way people uh, look at translators depends on the way they look at the, the authors these particular translators translated. Um, in Turkey, um, the, the, the thing is that, for example, an author uh, which uh, has written an, an obscene book, for example, um, has an effect on the translator of, of his book. An author who is seen as an, an obscene author uh, very often has as, uh, has as its effect that the, the translator of his book is also seen as a, an obscene uh, translator. 
And um, that might seem uh, from a, a Dutch perspective a bit far-fetched maybe. Uh, and here we, are, uh, we have been talking about very poetical uh, things, poetical sides of the, uh, of the topic of exile. But sometimes uh, this topic doesn't have, uh, not only has a very poetical sides, but also a very uh, concrete side. Uh, in, in Turkey it has been the case that uh, translators have been taken to court, for example, because of the, uh, the books they have been tra uh, translated, because their books were considered to be um, obscene. Um, that's one thing. And translators are very often seen as invisible. It's very often seen as a kind of uh, an easy task to do, as a very uh, secure thing to do, as a very um, um, as a profession without risks. But that's certainly not always the case. That's what I actually wanted to say. Another um, difference with authors, although that's maybe not so much the case for the two authors that are here with us uh, tonight, is that the translator has two languages at his uh, or her disposal. Uh, many authors write in one language. They have uh, this one language they, uh, they write, they, they live in, they write in. And exile for an author with his lang one language, of course, means means a lot, changes a lot. It changes the language and the language environment uh, the author works in. But a translator is constantly uh, busy with two languages. And a translator in exile, uh, if of course he is so lucky to, uh, to be in exile in a, in, a, in a culture where the language is uh, being used, he translates or she translates from, uh, has in that respect maybe less of uh, less of a difficulty uh, to deal with because as a translator we're used to uh, to deal with two languages, to travel between two languages, um, and we also I must uh, say when Buhan talked about uh, the uh, the beauty you need when you're in pain, the distance uh, you need when you're in pain, and exile, I think, is for many people a pain. I think the second language is also a way of, uh, of creating a distance. Um, and in that respect, it's maybe, it's maybe a bit easier for translators. Uh, they have this uh, the second language at their disposal, which always creates also a distance to to look from, uh, a distance to look from uh, when you're dealing with a difficult situation. But of course, another thing is, and that I experienced myself living as a translator into Dutch in Turkey, a second language, every, the, the two languages we're dealing with as a translator, both of them have to be fed. They have to be fed with new inputs. And for me, as a translator from Turkish, it's true for Turkish, but it's also true for my mother tongue, for Dutch. And living in Turkey, you get a lot of input from Turkish, but less input or hardly any input uh, from Dutch. And uh, that's for a translator, of course, always a very difficult situation. Living in, Tur uh, living in the Netherlands, for me as a translator of, into Dutch, it's better I get a lot of input uh, of Dutch now, but much less from, uh, from Turkish. And uh, for a translator living in one country, it's, uh, that's one of the difficulties, because you need the input in both languages. Um, yeah. Thank you. I, th I have to thank you also for pointing out that, of course, when we discuss the poetics of writing on exile, whether it's internally or externally, inside the country, outside the country, that the pain of the poetics and the politics, of course, are a challenge for you as well, because you're translating Turkish authors who might, I'm not sure, you have to tell me, um, go around certain themes because of their position within Turkey and how to translate the spaces in between that any Turkish reader immediately would understand but for a Dutch reader are, and I know it's a cliche sentence, but going to the mountains means something completely different for somebody from Limburg or from Groningen or for somebody who has Kurdish 
background, mm -hmm. isn't it? Um, yeah, that's uh, that's true. But I think as a as a literary translator, we're also very used to uh, to deal with those kind of things. I mean, you have uh, things that are being said uh, in between the lines when the author feels uh, not exactly uh, very free to, to write what he or she uh, would like to write. But you also have uh, all kinds of things that are being said in between the lines when an author is very free to, uh, to write what he or she uh, wants to. And as a translator, you always have to be uh, very aware of that and find ways of, uh, of dealing, that, uh, dealing with those things and find ways of um, expressing them in the other language. I think what is a big difference if you um, have, to, have to translate texts uh, from authors um, who are in a very precarious situation or uh, have to write things, although um, uh, they, they have not a lot of freedom to, uh, to write what they want. Uh, I think the big difference is that as a translator you feel even more responsibility for, uh, for the author you're translating and for the text. Because translating um, the text of such a person makes it more known, which might, be, uh, might mean a bigger uh, danger for the, uh, the original author. But it also means that uh, you have to be even more careful of the, of the wording you're uh, choosing. I know that some people might now think, why doesn't she ask for an example? This is exactly where my internal censorship comes in, because if I now ask you, can you give an example? Maybe you're exactly pointing out to somebody you don't want to point out to, so I will ask it in a different way. Um, you've been translating from Turkish into Dutch for the past... Uh, nearly 20 years. 20 years. Did you see a difference? Uh, what, what kind of, no, let's see, what kind of trend did you notice in the way Turkish authors deal with their changing environment? And of course, from the outside, we see some people say things are getting worse politically, there is less space. Did you feel a difference coming in the writing you've been translating? Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to say from the, the novels I've been translating because I also translated a lot of uh, well, what they call um, modern classics, so um, novels that have been written in the, the 50s, for example, or 1900, or... Uh, you like so it, it, I can uh, tell, huh? It's safer for you? Do you feel more secure to translate those novels? Uh, no, I like it because I like the novels, oh, okay. not because... Uh, <laughs> And, and the authors uh, who write uh, these novels. A reading but tip maybe for us? What? Maybe you have a reading tip here for the audience that you say, oh, this book, everybody should have read this book from the 50s. Nobody, I feel this is my favorite. Uh, I'm yes, to learn but my favorites are already in the Rams, uh, I must say. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, books disappear very quickly too. But um, no, I, th I think there are many authors I could uh, recommend. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, to come back to your question, to, to um, say whether there's anything changing in the way authors um, write or the, uh, the way or the, the, the kind of topics uh, they write about, I think that's really difficult to say, not only because, of, uh, because I've translated uh, books from such different periods in uh, Turkish history, but I think also because... Um, what we are experiencing maybe now in Turkey is also not a new thing. It's not uh, the case that, uh, uh, that restrictions on the uh, freedom of expression are something, is something from the last 10 years uh, has been very often uh, the case in Turkey. So also when you translate uh, other and older uh, authors, you have to deal with those uh, kind of things. And you were mentioning in your introduction that sometimes for Turkish translators, so translating foreign language books into Turkish, um, the choice of the books they would make could endanger their lives as well. I mean, so were you referring to books that might be controversial because of obscene content or political content that then are translated into Turkish and then might create yeah, revolutionize people, the readers. Uh, well, I think for translators, it's very often the case, uh, not always, but uh, very often the case that uh, the translator is not in a position to choose the book uh, he or she uh, is going to translate. So many translators and also many translators in Turkey 
translate a book that's uh, chosen by uh, a publishing house. And um, um, yes, of course, the, the, the choice of a book might create a problem for the publishing house or for the translator, uh, for the, the people involved with this, uh, this book, but it's very often not the choice of the translator, um, which book uh, he or she will start on. When you listen to uh, Hanneke, do you recognize what she's saying about the difficulties for translators um, in Turkey? You, you're nodding. What, what does it bring yeah, to mind? Well, first of all, I totally agree uh, with her that uh, we really should talk about more uh, on translation and uh, translators should be more part of uh, such panels, festivals, because then as authors, we're proud that uh, my book is in Dutch or in Arabic, whatever, but if they don't exist or if they don't do a good job, you really can reach a, a limited audience. So in that respect, I see it as a very underestimated function uh, as translators. And I think it's really very challenging. And um, I sort of like to think that a translated book is uh, another product. Uh, it's not uh, because the translator puts uh, her or his mind and talent and knowledge and her soul, if I may say, in, into it. Uh, so that book actually is a co-production of the two of you. Uh, you're lucky if you're working with a good translator, uh, but um, and even in that case, uh, it's not the original uh, product anymore, I think. There is an added value of the translator into the text. Yes, yeah. y yes, it has to be. It, is it, your, uh, I think so. is your, the translator of your book here in the room? Yes. So yes where is the it. translator of Istanbul, Istanbul? I think uh, we need to give him a bit of a attention. <laughs> <laughs> this is on, uh, we didn't prepare this, <laughs> but I will uh, we'll hold the mic. Tell us who you are. Uh, René van Veen. And you've been translating Istanbul, Istanbul. Yes, yes, I did, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, you don't like to be interviewed. Uh, of course, uh, do ask your question. Asking permission. What was your um, greatest challenge in translating the book in such a way that it's accessible to Dutch readers? Uh, that's the same with, with, with every book. Um, you start a book and, and by uh, going along the way, you get, uh, you get to know the writer, you get to know his style, you get to know the characters. And at the end, you just hope you have translated all right. So. Did you take a trip to Istanbul to see whether... I wanted to. You didn't go no, to it? No, no. You've never been... You were to Istanbul, you went to Istanbul before? No, I'm sorry. Oh my God! He translated a book about a love story for Istanbul, and I felt you took me along the city I know a little bit. So well written, well translated. I mean, where is uh, where is Jurgen? Yeah. Are you the publisher? No. Oh, too bad. Who? Where is the publisher? Ah, there's the publisher. What What is your publishing house called? It's called Orlando. Orlando. Well, um, and the book is available after today. Fantastic. Going back uh, to exactly this, what I noticed when I was reading the book in Dutch, I thought the translator is in love with Istanbul as well. So the basis was, what's your love story with Istanbul? Um, the Istanbul is the city in Turkey that uh, you are in love without seeing it. As the translator didn't need to see Istanbul in order to love it. I saw Istanbul for the first time when I was 17 years old. I went there for the university. But when I got there, I had already known Istanbul through fake, even Kurdish fairy tales, consists the city of Istanbul, all Turkish movies, all our uh, novels, songs, uh, when you get there, you feel that you are at home. You're nodding, you have the same thing. Yes, and I think um, not only Istanbul, but a few uh, more cities have that 
uh, Hollywood culture, New York. I think a lot of people might feel the same. We've been to New York in many movies, and when you're in New York, wow, I mean, I've been here. You, you get the same feeling. So Istanbul is really the heart of Turkey. So but everybody then, wants to go there, right? I think so. <laughs> but in your book, let's go back also to the politics of pain, or the poetry of pain. Um, there's also the longing of being able to go back to Istanbul. We don't know what happens. The characters don't know. They don't know whether they'll survive. So it's almost cruel what you did to those characters. Can you tell us now if they die or if they survive? Uh, that, that no. Was, uh, no, spoiler. Uh, okay. No, but there is kind of cruelty with these riddles and the poetry of the beautiful city. Maybe I, uh, just speculating now, <laughs> maybe I wanted to, to apply uh, Bertolt Brecht's epic theater uh, method into novel. Our characters has got a destiny. They fate in the hands of the reader. If we did this, they will be free. Their fate is in the hand of the reader. Yeah. I love that sentence. Uh, yeah. <laughs> definitely. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen to them. Because we don't know what's going to happen to Turkey. It all depends on us. It all depends on me. Whatever I do, the Turkey's future will be shaped in that way. Yeah. And that's a riddle we cannot solve in a week, <laughs> for sure not. No, it, it takes days. It takes days, <laughs> yeah. Um, in your book, Exile, it's clear what happens to some of the characters. I was struck by the recurring sentence, why are there so many suicides in Batman? Batman? Batman. Not Batman. Um, why did that thread, I mean, and we don't want to do a spoiler, but you chose it for a reason. Mm -hmm. It comes back. Why? Well, first of all, you know, we, uh, we Turkish people, sometimes we tend to close our eyes and think everything is okay and it just disappears. Um, and we are a very poorly uh, statistical country. We have, we don't have too many statistics uh, on many things. Um, it was only, it's only mentioned in a, new, in a few newspapers. There are a lot of women who commit suicide. There were a, a, at some periods as well. Uh, in Batman, which is in the, uh, it's not Batman, huh? it's Batman. No, no, uh, yeah, no, no, not, not for we, you. We but also have a Batman, yeah, Batman yeah. in uh, Overijssel, eh? so there is a yeah. place that yeah, has yeah. almost the same name in the Netherlands. Yeah, but mine is, is not a hero, my uh, characters. Yeah, so. Um, and those young women, and I mean like 15, 16, 17, 18 young girls, they just commit suicide and then it's taken for, you know, it's, it's, it's acted as if it's a normal thing. Nobody questions it, uh, nobody goes there and asks what's happening. Hey people, why are you committing suicide? What's happening? And sometimes we know that some of the cases are murders by the families. They're either honor killings, they're either, um, you know, women murders, and we don't talk about these things. So, oh, a lot of girls commit suicide in Batman, yeah. I mean, that struck me, and that really got me very angry uh, at a point when I uh, sort of digged into it. That's why uh, I said maybe, you know, at least I should give, the, give them a speech in my own little miserable book and... Uh. Is raising this question at the moment a dangerous question in Turkey? Well, everything is dangerous and nothing is dangerous. It's uh, not, not, not really, not really. It's not as uh, critical as politics, women lives, women committing suicide. It's not that critical, uh, yeah, there are other issues. What do you think is the most critical question you asked in your book? Oh, um... Dangerous question. Wow, okay. I think talking about, well, what, uh, uh, and I can speak on the experience that I got from uh, some of the circles. When I talked about incest, uh, 
sexual harassment in the household, that was like, really people came on to me about it. It was like, ooh, you know, how can you be even saying that? There was a, a journalist, Me uh, Melis Alpan, who wrote about it, and they totally uh, sort of, you know, uh, said she was a pervert and she was lying. Actually, she was only talking about uh, the figure. So I think that was um, the most sensitive issue in the book, uh, in the Turkish society. I read both of your books over the past uh, couple of days, and there is... I wouldn't say an accusation of masculinity, but definitely, I mean, we can discuss whether you can say toxic masculinity or masculinity in itself is already toxic, but let's say toxic masculinity in certain societies in the family atmosphere and not so much political, even though some of the violence translates into political violence. And then in your book, I see these very gentle caring, I think men. all four of them are, yeah. all four men are extremely caring. So in a way, yeah. I was reading your book and I saw <laughs> the horror of what masculinity can do in a society and then I'm reading your book, four men in a prison cell and they are in this horrible environment but really taking care of each other. Um, in every society, I believe, uh, we can find everything in the same pot. Um, the devil and the angel, they're hand in hand. Uh, the sexual crime in the families are very common in Turkey, we, we can see that. Uh, a young woman should be very courageous to walk on her own at night in Istanbul on a side street. But we experienced some other things as well. Five years ago, there was an uprising called Gezi Park Uprising. We were about one million people occupied that Gezi Park just to protect it from uh, being demolished. One million people were there two weeks. There was not a single incident of harassment against women. We have seen that part of society as well. Um, I think we have to value those both part of uh, our nature and we have to choose which part we promote. I know that the current government is promoting masculinity. Our current president openly said that I don't believe the equality of men and women. He said that many times in front of press. Then how can you expect this society respects women's rights. So to protect that rights or to raise that issue of equality is on our shoulder, not on that government anymore. We have to defend it against that government. As a citizen, this is my job. I'm going uh, to collect some observations from the audience. Um, and uh, I will collect a few observations and then call back and we do it like a ship. Huh? I'll go like the ferry in Istanbul. I go back and forth. Um, the, the people who know me know that I always have rules. There's one golden rule. We don't want another lecture. Anybody who goes over 30 to 40 seconds will buy drinks for the other people around them. And I'm the judge. <laughs> You know, the Bali is not a very rich institution. I always agree on this. Don't know. It's not a permission to say, okay, I'll buy all of you a drink and I'll speak for 20 minutes. Huh? So just to say. Um, and let's do some observations, questions. Feel free. Who can I uh, invite to share something? Kaukje. I'll come to you and uh, I will keep the mic. Yeah, very nice. so don't <laughs> and please tell us who you are. Um, I'm Frank Santing. I'm a journalist, an author, and I'm already for long years connected with Turkey. Um, I would like you, both of you, and also Hanneke, to, to ask um, a little bit about what this exile, people who are leaving Turkey, is doing with the situation inside Turkey. Um, do you, does it, it has an effect on nowadays Turkey that so many people are leaving? And Chile is a, an example of it. You came back. Um, so, what is the impact of the exile 
on, and I would say on the literary and on the freedom of expression front. Thank you. Maybe you can already immediately answer to this question because it's an important question. Well? Um, yeah, uh, people have been leaving country. Uh, wherever I go for meetings, for events in Europe, uh, always I come across about 10 or 20 young academics who just left Turkey some months ago. Um, in the last couple of years, the uh, Turkish government expelled more than 150,000 civil servants, including 50,000 school teachers, more than 5,000 academics from universities. And all those people are unemployed. They don't have no money, no security, no future. They are left to die. So one of the options is if they manage to go abroad to have a new life for their family. It's so difficult. In Turkey, in daily life, you cannot see those kind of incidents on the newspapers because 90 percent, not exaggerating, 90 percent of media directly controlled by the government. Erdogan's government managed to seize all that power. So you don't see anything uh, on, on TV or on uh, newspapers, apart from a couple of opposition newspapers. Well, uh, free, freedom of expression, uh, yes. But maybe I think uh, people are living uh, as well with more solid uh, and primitive uh, needs or intuitions. Uh, just like Burhan was saying, like jobs, really some of, like most of my friends from magazines, and I'm not talking about only political newspapers, like lifestyle magazines, like Vogue, Elle, you know, all those brands. Now they're becoming something uh, that is against the nature of that, uh, th what they do. So um, some of the people really are, are either without jobs or they do not uh, feel that they can do their jobs in the way they want to anymore. Um, so it's, um, I think people are worried as well when, uh, especially people with kids, they're a bit worried about the future uh, of their kids. For us, the breaking point uh, was um, the education system. Um, we want Ava, our daughter, to keep questioning. She really hasn't heard of, she doesn't know the word hell or heaven. She, she hasn't come across with it. Or like I, she can choose or be whatever she wants, but I want her to question. But even if you're t sending your kid to a private school now, um, they they might get exposed to concepts, to, to things that their um, na naive minds are not ready to face, uh, and that I find very dangerous uh, for a kid because. Uh, I think it's like you should feed them with the amount of food and with the right amount of food at the right amount of uh, maltide. Yeah. Um, so uh, that that for us that was it. And I know from a lot of friends uh, from the creative circle, editors, designers, writers, they really are worried uh, more the more for their kids. Uh, so that's why they move or want to move uh, from the country. Just as a follow-up question. You came back. Uh, maybe okay. I could uh, answer that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but okay. I'm, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no. I'll keep my follow-up question because you wanted to say something, and I like to be in the moment. So tell me what would you like to say? Yeah. Uh, well, as an answer to maybe not so much the uh, the effects of exile, but I think uh, there are effects uh, of the current situation in uh, in Turkey for the the literary landscape, as it's uh, as it's always uh, called. Um, I think things uh, changed even more now that the uh, economic crisis is, uh, is getting so, uh, so bad. But I also think that it didn't really start with the economic crisis, it started already uh, before. Um, there are, I think, uh, less and less uh, books being translated into Turkish. Uh, the, the numbers of, uh, of books that are uh, being published in, uh, in Turkey really drop a lot, some big publishing uh, houses. Uh, now publish maybe uh, 10 or 20 percent of the uh, the number of new titles that they used to uh, to publish. So less and less uh, new books come into the uh, the country. 
uh, small presses uh, very often have to, to stop completely because they, they can't cope uh, economically uh, with the, the situation anymore. So I think the, uh, the literary landscape is, uh, as a, a result of this whole situation, uh, changing really uh, rather in a, in a big way. Um, um, because that was yeah, my follow-up question to Burhan, because you came back, so you could see the difference. I mean, did you see the change in the literary landscape? Of course you have been traveling back and forth when you were, or were you not traveling back and forth over the past yeah, 10 years? I, I do travel still, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, everyone in Turkey, uh, friends, members of family say, you got a British passport, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> when are you going back to Britain, always they say. Uh, but they don't know that I've been in exile once. I know what it is like. I don't want to experience it again in the same way. I was forced to leave country 20 years ago. After so many years, I managed to come back. I don't want to live again in that way. No, not at all. Suffering in exile psychologically is worse than suffering in Turkey under the, the rule of Erdogan for me. That's a personal answer. I cannot, you know, say that everyone uh, will feel the same thing. But the, for the people who, who have not been in exile before, I think they should go to exile to save themselves and their family. They have that right, because this world and this life belongs to everyone. They don't have to suffer under Erdogan's regime. But it's a wicked game almost, huh? It's a self-fulfilling prophecy because when people, I mean, I've seen this with my Iraqi and with my Syrian friends, then the people who leave are seen as some of betraying. Yeah, I, I know, know the feeling. Kind of, I know the feeling. You know yeah. the feeling. That's what you wanted to say. Uh, no, I, I, I wanted to add, add actually to what Hanika said. I think she mentioned something very important since we are talking about literature here as well. I noticed also through our agent, uh, our common agent, there are a few things that you can really notice. Uh, first of all, you know the distribution channels are very important for you to find the book in the bookstores. And now uh, many of the biggest uh, bookstore chains and the distribution channels that they have are also owned by the government. Uh, so after a year, it was the first time I went back to Turkey in the summer and I of course came back with 20 books. but. Finding them was so hard. Normally, you would just walk to a bookstore and find somebody who's controversial, somebody, a communist, a socialist, Kurdish communist, whatever, you know. You would find it, but even the boy was really like whispering to me, you know, it's so bad. We really cannot sell these anymore. That's one thing. And the other thing is to be translated, most of the agents and most of the publishing houses are using funds. And government, oh, uh, they can actually fund you. And they've been doing it uh, till a few years ago. And uh, like Oya Baydar or Burhan Sömez, they will never get a fund from the government. So it's very challenging. Now there is only a very limited circle of writers who get the, who get the fund to be translated, who get into the bookstores, and who can actually be, be read. So this is happening in Turkey, and I witnessed this translation transition really in a harsh way this summer. So this, this is not good for the culture, real life of Turkey, I think. I'm going to see whether there are more questions. I'll uh, go from completely in the back, and then I'll go here, and then I'll look one more time here, and then we have to close the evening. Can you come a little bit closer? OK. I'm sorry, but because I want to keep the mic. Hi, who are you? Uh, Frederike Geerink, uh, journalist and writer. I have a question for Hanneke. Um, you talked about invisibility of translators. I was wondering if you can also, um, if you can also use that by translating controversial authors um, and give them more visibility in Holland um, and, and thus giving them more, um, more visibility. Or do you think if you translate controversial writers that it would get you into trouble if you go to Istanbul and not get in anymore, or 
How uh, can you reflect on this? Yeah, um, yeah. Thank I you. think maybe in uh, in the introduction I uh, uh, didn't say it very uh, clearly, but uh, what I meant to say was that. Uh, um, well, fate is maybe a, a big word, but uh, um, well, uh, uh, I can't think of another word now, but the fate of a translator is very uh, closely connected to the fate of an author. Um, and, um, you know, just as uh, an author that writes uh, difficult books, um, uh, the, the translator of an author that writes difficult books is very often seen as a good translator. Um, but uh, the translator of um, an author that writes obscene books is very often seen as an obscene translator, and the translator of a book of an author that writes controversial books is seen as a controversial uh, translator. So the, um, the way people look at the translator is very often very closely connected to the way uh, they look at the, the original author or the original book. Maybe I and can rephrase your question, because... I think what she also wanted to ask, and correct me if I'm wrong, can you yourself choose the writers you would want to translate? Or are you offered To a books? certain extent, yeah, yes, yeah. yes. And, and I, I think every translator can, yeah. um, and would you want can try and uh, uh, convince a publisher of the, yeah. the value of a book, of why it's very important to have this particular book yeah, yeah. Uh, translated. And uh, if you're lucky, you uh, manage to convince the publishing house and you can translate the book you choose. Mm. But well, sometimes maybe, uh, it's impossible. Maybe afterwards you can ch exchange notes on certain books that I think you feel need <laughs> translation. <laughs> and then you can discuss whether you can translate them. I can sort of figure out which books you would want to have translated. You had a question as well, huh? Can you tell us who you are? My name is Arturo de Simone. I'm a writer from Aruba and from Argentina. So I'm a citizen of Argentina. And uh, I wanted to ask the author of uh, Istanbul. Istanbul, uh, well, whenever I speak to, to, to Kurds, uh, quite often they sound very, very confident that one day they will win this battle, this struggle against their many enemies and so on, but when I, I'm, I'm a bit surprised when you say that you are confident that the, the language of your mother is, is doomed, that this Kurdish language will not exist within a generation, and I wonder why are you pessimistic about the, the survival of the Kurdish language, I mean if the Kurds are seem at least to, to in my, in these Encou few encounters I've had there, they sound very confident that they will win the peace. So. Beautiful question. Um, <clears throat> I think I, I need to re explain myself. <clears throat> I'm not pessimistic. Uh, on the opposite, uh, I'm very much optimistic about the future of the Kurdish language. When I gave that example, I meant my generation of my region. Uh, we grew up uh, in a limited environment of uh, language freedom. So uh, my generation all write in Turkish, but on the other hand, the younger generation, they write in Kurdish. We got a great Kurdish poet here, one of the best uh, translators from European language into Kurdish, Kavan Nemi. Their generation, they are the future of our language. In, when it comes to Kurdish language, uh, I think there is no question mark about it. It's already won. The language and the culture will survive. The question is about the politics, you know, on, on the territory, what's going on. It's not our question at the moment. Thank you. Munir. Yes, um, thank you. I was wondering, because of course Turkey has seen many coups and many different regimes, but somehow I got a very gloomy feeling when you described the whole literary landscape and everything that's happening now. And of course, I also follow Turkey and I've been there many times and I saw huge changes in a very short amount of time. Uh, and I'm just an observer from the outside. So I was wondering, is this change, and especially combined with the economic crisis and combined with the outflux of inte intelligentsia, uh, will it have a big impact, you think, on the cultural scene of Turkey and, and the, the overall 
future? Or is it just another coup and another phase in a very difficult process that's the birth of Turkey still as a separate country and entity, as we've seen in the last century? Thank you. Well, um, uh, it's, it's true that uh, the Turkish Republic trying to be a nation state, uh, it wasn't easy having uh, survived the Ottoman Empire and they didn't want, they wanted, the Turkish Republic wanted to be anything that isn't the Ottoman Empire. So that was a very uh, net uh, statement. Um, but th there was one thing, um, and of course, many mistakes as well. Uh, but there was one thing: the ship, your ship, was having um, uh, education. I, I don't want to call it civilization because it's a very controversial word to me. But education and scientific thinking. Uh, I see maybe Burhan thinks something else, but we have never actually been a democratic country for sure. We're still learning. It is a process. I agree with you. Um, although I might, I might sound very pessimistic, I'm not. Um, there will maybe come a time that we will learn that. But the, now the ship has, um, uh, is going another direction. Uh, it changed the direction, which is not scientific thinking. And um, uh, the for forward uh, direction anymore that I see is leaving uh, permanent, and that w that might leave long-lasting uh, effects on the society for a few generations. That's my fear. Um, maybe we have to uh, avoid uh, just isolating Turkey in that matter. Turkey is not alone, unfortunately. Um, five years ago, I think, I went to New York and my publisher and other people, there were some events. People were always talking about Turkey. They would feel very pity for me. And then I went there last year again. There was no mention of Turkey. I was talking about Trump. I was telling, don't worry, OK, it will <laughs> get better. Uh, look at all the world. Look at India with Modi. Look at Philippines with du Duarte. Look at Hungary with Orban, Putin. Look at Britain with the Brexit and new rising in, in countries like my uh, uh, home country, new uh, politics of populism and also rising of new racism in Central Europe. Every part of the world is burning in a different way. We have to address all of them together. There is not a single solution. We cannot save Turkey if we we don't aim to save everywhere altogether. One question here, and then I have one or two questions here. I'll collect them, and then we'll do a, round, uh, a last word for the panel. So please keep it brief, and you can think of the answer, and I'll collect a few more questions. Kulina um, a PhD student. Uh, I have a question for Hanuk and maybe Rene. Um, I don't believe that the translator is invisible. They can actually recreate certain power relations. And in the Dutch society, there are stereotypes about Turkish culture, exotic culture, beautiful culture, but whose values are not, some believe, compatible with the Dutch culture. So while translating the books, do you feel that you're certainly responsible, to a certain extent, to reinforce um, those stereotypes? Because, for example, Ilhan's book will, again, feel into the same stereotype about toxic masculinity in, uh, in Turkey. So mm -hmm. do you feel responsible for this, or do you feel that you should challenge this? What's your attitude about it? Okay, we'll, uh, we'll just save the answer and I'll collect a few more. I saw some hands here. Not anymore? <laughs> we scared them away. Hi, um, I'd like to ask um, Bohan if you think that your book will ever be translated or your books will be translated into Kurdish. Is that hope you have? Okay, well, one more. I thought there was another hand here, so I'll go back to the stage. Um, first Hanukkah, and then I'll have our two Turkish, Kurdish, Turkish writers. Mm -hmm. Last word for this evening. Uh, yes, I think, uh, well, thank you for your uh, question. Um, when 
I said uh, a translator is very often invisible. I didn't mean uh, to say that uh, he or she doesn't have a responsibility or that he or she doesn't leave uh, 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 his or her traces in the, in the text, in translation. I think every translator does, just as much as every uh, reader reads uh, a book in a different way, uh, a, translator's, a translator also reads and also translates. Uh, a certain text in uh, in his or her own way, um, and yes, I agree that uh, there are certain stereotypes when it comes to uh, to Turkey. Stereotypes that live, for example, uh, with uh, Dutch readers, uh, and I think to a certain extent, uh, yes, you can have a, a, an influence on it. Of course, you're bound to the uh, the original text, but. Maybe one uh, thing that comes to my mind now is um, the very first uh, Dutch translations of uh, Turkish literature very often had uh, uh, in the back of the book uh, a list with Turkish words, uh, which were then very often the Turkish names of certain dishes or Turkish names of certain types of clothing you don't have in the Netherlands or the names of uh, certain... Um, uh, religious uh, feasts or, or things that have to do with Islam. And then uh, sometimes it was even the case that this, uh, certain uh, Turkish words in these lists were translated with a single Dutch word, which then raises the question, why not use this single Dutch word just in the text instead of putting it in the back of, uh, 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 of the book in a, in a separate word list? And I think one uh, thing that has to do, uh, or one reason why people would choose to uh, to make such a word list, for Turk, especially for uh, translations from Turkish, uh, whereas you wouldn't see those kind of word lists in uh, translations from German literature or French literature or Spanish literature, is that people uh, would think, oh, Turkey is such an exotic culture, everything must be very different there, and uh, it's impossible to say that really in Dutch. And I think that uh, uh, when you translate from German or when you translate from French, there are just as much uh, words and uh, concepts that you could put in a, uh, in a list, uh, ex uh, listed explanations in the book, uh, in the back of the book, as you can do with words in uh, a translation from a Turkish text. So I think um, that as a translator you can um, approach a text as something very exotic or coming from a very exotic culture and, and see it as such, or you can approach a text as something um, similar and uh, or something uh, that at least is to a certain extent comprehensible. Um, and I think that's a choice a translator can make. And uh, that's also a choice that very much influences and affects uh, a translation. And also the way, uh, yeah, uh, what you say, uh, stereotypes people might have about certain culture. So I think as a translator, yes, in a certain way you are invisible, uh, but you, which doesn't mean that you can also have uh, a big influence on the text. Tiller, would you like to react to this discussion as well on what kind of images one uses? Is toxic masculinity a stereotype for Turkey only or for all the countries Burhan has been describing where I would say testosterone politicians are running the show, being in a competition with each other? I mean, do we have to deny? I mean, I think, I mean, I hope I did justice to uh, Chilo's book. It's way beyond any stereotype. I told you, it's like every single page has a painting of uh, words. I mean, how do you deal with this? That as a Turkish author, even though you might be describing things that you find very disturbing or beautiful, then somebody would say, yeah, but that's stereotypical. Well, uh, it, well, it's it's a difficult question. Um, it's very easy to generalize things, and um, it's it, I think it's very easy to um, uh, make prototypes. Uh, but a human nature is incomprehensible, and um, there are 
there are so many dimensions to it. I think you can really, you have this huge universe of that essence that you can play with in literature. And I find it challenging and beautiful. I know this doesn't answer your question, but well, I'm actually, going to wrap it up. No. <laughs> actually, <laughs> it did. It did. <laughs> there's, there's another painting coming okay. up, I can tell. <laughs> we had a very specific question for you, Boran. Um, yeah, the answer is yes. Uh, my novels are being translated into Kurdish. Not Istanbul yet, but the previous novel already been published in Kurdish in Turkey. Is it allowed to be sold? The question is. Yeah, yeah, yes, it, yes, it's free. It's okay. free to sell. Okay, probably the more illegal copies that are being made is also a good indication <laughs> of the success, huh? The under the ta yeah. table uh, sales, ladies and gentlemen, the politics of writing, the writing of politics, the poetry of pain, the creativity in exile, but also the longing not to be in exile. We discussed all of this. And I think one of the thoughts that remain with me is, why is it that these rulers, not only in Turkey, but in other countries, are so afraid of the word? I think because they know that if you want to remain hopeful, people will look at the writers. They will look at literature, because that's where you find the hope. Um, however painful it is what you're reading. Being taken to Istanbul through the beautiful translation, it made clear that why we had Haneke here as well. The accessibility of this beautiful writing of both of you. We need interpreters. I think interpreters, translators bring us much more than just a literary, literary translation. So I thank you, Hanneke, Burhan, Tiller. Please give them a warm applause. And a warm applause to the team of the Bali, and of course to Penn Netherlands, because you brought us all together. Thank you very much. Drinks at the bar.